Hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Actually, good afternoon, wow. Um, thank you for bearing with us as we get started a little bit late. Uh, welcome to Carbon Take Back, Producer Responsibility for Oil and Gas at the Bologna Pavilion. Thank you so much for having us to Bologna, uh, all the other sponsors of this, of this pavilion, uh, and welcome. And the first thing you'll notice is that I am not Dr. Gabriel Walker. Uh, my name is Eli Mitchell Larson. Uh, I'm an associate at Oxford Net Zero, and I'm also leading the launch of a new organization called Carbon Gap. We're an independent advocacy group uh, focused on advancing carbon removal policy in Europe. So really making a leader, uh, Europe a leader in, in uh, scaling carbon removal. Um, you can catch Dr. Gabriel Walker at 4.30 actually at the Hydro Zone, I highly recommend it. Um, but here we are today with a fantastic panel uh, and a really great topic to explore. So what I'm gonna do is introduce all three of the, pres the presenters and then they'll go one after another. What's great about the format we have for today is after we talk about the carbon uh, take back obligation and the policy and the sort of details of it, we'll actually have reactions from several folks, uh, civil society, uh, as well as uh, uh, another ENGO. So we'll, we'll get some reactions to the policy, then we'll hand it over to you. So, and by you, I mean, not only the folks present in the room, but also those of us who are, those who are joining us on YouTube. So please keep your questions coming. And after we've had reactions, we'll hear from all of you. So we have a great uh, panel lined up. Uh, first, we'll have uh, Marguerite Kuyper. Uh, she's uh, a carbon management and CCS advisor independent. After spending 30 years in the energy industry, she's now a, a real uh, leading uh, policy advocate in this field. She's actually at, I would say, the, the cutting edge of advancing this policy in the Netherlands. She's single-handedly arranged uh, a stakeholder study, pulling together lots of groups to actually see if we can put this into practice, the idea of carbon take back. Um, next, we'll hear from Professor Miles Allen, who's the lead researcher at the Oxford Martin program on the post-carbon transition. He's also the director of Oxford Net Zero and a professor of geosystem science in the School of Geography and Environment and the Department of Physics. He's also been referred to as the physicist behind Net Zero uh, by the BBC, and he was the coordinating uh, lead author for the 2018 uh, IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees, and he's telling me to, to finish his introduction now. Welcome, Lee. Uh, and, and third, we'll hear from doc, Dr. Catherine Romanak. She's a geochemist with over 20 years of experience in monitoring CO2 storage projects. Um, she's developed and implemented environmental monitoring programs at several large scale uh, US DOE CCUS project sites and has collaborated in uh, projects around the world, Canada, Australia, and Japan. Uh, she serves on multiple international CCUS advisory boards and regularly informs global policy within the United Nations uh, framework convention on climate change. So I'll ask the three presenters to just hand it off to the next and then I'll, I'll come back and join you uh, when it's time for the reaction. So without further ado, let's turn to Marguerite to hear what is the carbon take back obligation? How does it work? Let's get our heads around this policy before we can start to debate and dig into it. Thank you. Uh, well, that's loud. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, this afternoon, a uh, great exciting session on the climate take back obligation. And what I will do is I'll kick off by telling you what it is. My experience is that depending on people's background, um, they understand it in, in different ways. So I'll actually explain it in three different ways so that everybody can pick their own favorite way of uh, understanding it. Uh, then I'll say something about the core elements of a climate take back obligation. Uh, how does it work? I'll say a little bit more about the Dutch uh, climate take back studies. Since last year, we've uh, last year we've done a big study, and this year we've done doing a follow up study. So I'll explain what uh, th those studies are about, and there is online information also if people want to know more. And the last thing is uh, what's next. So what things could we do next to get this going in practice? The first thing is net zero. As everybody knows, uh, more and more countries are committing now to net zero emissions. And that basically means that every molecule of greenhouse gas emitted has to be compensated for by a molecule taken out of the atmosphere. That's atmospheric net zero. But indirectly, that also means that for the geosphere, you also have to balance production with storage. So for every ton of fossil carbon that you take out of the ground, you have to store a ton of carbon permanently. Um, and that is what we are 
getting at with the carbon takeback obligation, we say, well, great to manage the emissions, but why don't we also um, manage the production? So stock management, basically. So if you, if you wanna take carbon out of the ground, you're becoming responsible for also putting carbon into the ground so that in the year that we wanna be net zero, there is as much carbon being stored as being taken out of the ground. The bathtub analogy, I think a lot of people know, uh, that's on the right-hand side. It's basically the carbon budget. We throw water in at the top, greenhouse gases, the bathtub gets fuller and fuller. And at some point our carbon budget is, is used up basically. Um, the bathtub could even start overflowing. And I guess that's what you would call overshoot. And then you have to start mopping up from the floor to get back to your carbon budget. What we're proposing to do, because in most of these pictures, they only show the bathtub, but that water is coming from somewhere. It's coming from an upsource uh, reservoir. And we're saying, really, you should start thinking about overflowing the bathtub at the moment that you take the decision to start take water out of that upstream reservoir. Then you st should start thinking about, can I actually still add to that bathtub or can I remove from the bathtub also and store that so that in the end, the bathtub, the level in the bathtub doesn't uh, increase anymore. So there's two ways to do that. And they're shown in that picture. The first one is to capture the water before it gets in the bathtub. And that's basically carbon capture and storage at point source. So for example, a power plant or a big industry or a cement factory, you can capture the CO2 before it um, gets into the atmosphere. And the other one is to actually take it out of the atmosphere. That's the carbon removal options. And the ones that are relevant for us are things like bioenergy and carbon storage and direct air capture, mineralization, basically any option that keeps the carbon out of the short cycle uh, carbon loop between the atmosphere and the biosphere. And the third way to explain this is to basically say, everybody knows these days the schemes that there are for producer responsibility. We have to go to a more circular economy where basically if you produce a product and sell it on the market, you become co-responsible for the waste management of that product. Um, what we're saying is why don't we do the same with fossil energy? We know that if you burn it, there will be waste, CO2, why don't you make the producer responsible? Um, if you want to sell that product on the market, then you have to set up a collection scheme, uh, basically a tra transport and storage scheme so that the waste can be taken back and stored safely underground so that it doesn't get into the atmosphere. So that's the three ways I think people uh, can understand the climate takeback obligation. The core elements of carbon takeback obligation are the storage obligation, the storage fraction, and the carbon storage unit. The storage obligation is an obligation to permanently store carbon for producers and suppliers of fossil carbon products. So very high up in the value chain, we say, if you want to produce carbon and sell it on this market, you have a responsibility to think about the waste phase of your product. That's the obligation. The stored fraction is basically the carbon stored divided by the carbon produced. And at the moment we are roughly at 0% and we know we have to go to 100% in the net zero year. With the carbon take back obligation, we formalize the process of managing and monitoring that storage fraction. And we put the responsibility for progress uh, with a higher and higher percentage with the producer uh, of carbon, fossil carbon. And the third thing is the carbon storage unit because you need some a way of monitoring it, of course. Uh, very similar to emission allowances. If you emit, you have to hand in an emission allowance. What we say is if you produce carbon, you have to hand in a carbon storage unit. So you have to purchase carbon storage from human someone who is actually storing carbon for every ton of carbon put in the ground you get a carbon storage unit 
and these carbon storage units are valuable for the people who want to produce carbon because they need a carbon storage unit to be allowed to take carbon out of the ground. And that's the only thing a carbon storage unit uh, can be used for. And I would like to repeat that three times uh, because that's where usually the confusion starts because a carbon storage unit cannot be deducted from your emissions. The, the carbon storage unit's only purpose is to keep track of carbon out and carbon into the ground. And so the only thing you can use the carbon storage unit for is to hand it in if you want to produce and sell fossil carbons. Um, it's there for a supply side policy. People often say, why don't we just you know, rely on carbon pricing uh, on emissions? This is a supply side policy and emissions trading, uh, emission allowances is a demand side policy. So it complements uh, demand side policies like uh, carbon pricing on emissions. The CTBO studies in the Netherlands, we started in 2020, uh, the government, uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, Climate Change and uh, the oil and gas operators um, sponsored it together. And we had a very big uh, sounding board, we call it, uh, basically scientists, NGOs, um, investors, also uh, banking people. Um, and they helped thinking through what is a carbon take back obligation and how could we make it work in the Netherlands? Uh, I'll say a bit more about the objectives that came out of that. So that really was a stakeholder exercise to find out how people uh, uh, viewed this and what they thought would be the benefits of uh, adding a carbon take back obligation. At the moment, we just started a follow up study. And in that study, we look in more detail for fossil gas. Uh, that's, I'll explain that later why only for uh, gas. And we look at how we can use the regulations that are already in place for producer responsibility, for example, for waste of uh, uh, yeah, packaging or for electronic waste or whatever. So those schemes, can we use the regulations for that for fossil gas? And what will be the economic impact for different groups in society? What's the pluses and the minuses? And uh, is it overall an interesting way of going? And how can we scale up is the third thing that we'll be looking at. The results of the 2020 study is, I think, uh, fairly important, the shared objectives. So we're using those all the time to check again uh, when we have options or choices to make, how, does, how do these uh, score against these shared objectives that we have agreed with? And there's three of them. One is the emissions net zero. Um, that's the logical one, of course. The second one is also important. If you make a new decision on fossil energy production, whether it's a new field like the Congo field in the UK or the Netherlands, we're talking about gas production still, um, it has to include conditions so that that can be done in a Paris compliant way. So with a carbon take back obligation in those conditions, you can make those decisions robust also for um, meeting your emission targets. And the third one is a broadly supported business model and broadly supported means by NGO and by companies. At the moment, we have the problem that uh, CCS is often still subsidized. So there's subsidy schemes. And in the long run, that's, there's no public support for that because fossil energy should pay their own way, of course, when they clean up their waste. So, we need a business model where we can phase out subsidies as soon as possible. And we need long-term certainty so that companies can invest. Well, carbon take-back obligation can provide both. The boundary conditions are the same ones that we hear for all the uh, policy ideas, of course. It shouldn't show, uh, slow down the transition. So no unnecessary lock-ins of uh, old technology. And it should not make uh, the Netherlands less attractive for investments by uh, industry. So keep a level playing field with competitors. So why are we focusing on fossil gas? Uh, the two pictures you see on the right hand side are the um, expected fossil gas use by a company uh, by DNV, but IEA has a very similar scenario where they say 
if we go, continue as is, this is more or less what's going to happen. And you see in 2050, we use more or less the same amount of gas as we use today. They also make net zero scenarios these days and say what we should be doing is what you see at the bottom. And then gas goes down about 55% uh, compared to now. But, but so we can say that in 2050, we will use between 40 and 100% of the amount of gas we use now. And that is just, um, to do that unmitigated means a lot of emissions. And we need to avoid that. And we can avoid that because gas is very easily converted into hydrogen or electricity. Hydrogen and electricity, as you know, are the energy carriers of the future of a more sustainable energy system. So what we're saying is with the carbon take back obligation, we can encourage that switch to the energy carriers of the future, hydrogen, electricity, blue ammonia, a lot more quickly uh, by encouraging the producers to not sell natural gas anymore to their customers, but hydrogen or ammonia or electricity. And what will this lead to? Um, Clarity on long-term policy, uh, we need that. We have an incredible volatile market at the moment because nobody knows what's gonna happen anymore. Will all my uh, assets be stranded in five years time or are we gonna remain addicted and is it gonna be very profitable actually with very high prices? What's happening? So very uncertain investment climate. I think with the carbon take back obligation, we say this is the way we're gonna manage the impact of fossil energy. It's got to go down in time. It's got to become more expensive because they're basically internalizing the cost of the waste disposal in the price of their product. So renewables will be competitive more quickly, but there will be more certainty about the investment climate. Carbon removal technologies will also be uh, basically promoted because at some point you've captured all your large uh, sources and if there's still demand for your product, you will have to do carbon removal, think back of the bathtub to make sure that level in the bathtub doesn't start rising. And it will lead to cooperation in the value chain. At the moment, we're pinching at the end of the value chain at the emitter. We're saying you cannot amend it, but we have a lot of uh, parties uh, from between production and the emitter point that are making nice money of the value chain but by making the producer responsible that will force cooperation in the value chain. What's next? Uh, well, I already said we were doing the study in the Netherlands. Uh, so we are trying to get it more detail how we can implement it for fossil gas. We also would like to engage at North Sea and EU level. That's part of the uh, plan for the next uh, few months because we think the North Sea is the ideal carbon take back region. So then you can start trading carbon storage units between the different countries. And um, yeah, a lot of talks and lobbying, of course, to increase the pressure on large gas producers and producing countries to start supporting carbon take back obligations. I think that's the end. Uh, this is more or less the same as I said before. So I think this is a Thank you. Thanks very much, Marguerite. It's a pleasure to share the stage uh, with you. Um, and uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for, for, again for coming to the session and to Bologna for helping make it happen. Um, and uh, those following on YouTube, um, just to remind you, there is a uh, there will be there is a chat function enabled on YouTube, and Eli apparently is able to see your comments. Um, so uh, so you can you can feed comments in uh, that way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm Miles Allen, and uh, Stuart Hazeldean was the chap who was dropping bits of paper all over the floor, um, and is, actually is still here, so I, I can insult him to his face, but he's busy talking. Um, Stuart and I have been working on the carbon take-back obligation for, uh, for many years uh, under different names. Um, it only really started to gain traction when Marguerite called it the carbon take-back obligation. So, so that was clearly the, the crucial step that we, we gave it various names in the past, but here we are now. Can we switch to my presentation? My PowerPoint. Oh, I see. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, a big one. Okay, so I'm I'm talking to you about a, a study just published in the journal Jewel uh, last uh, last week, 
um, led by uh, Stuart Jenkins, who I very much hope is watching us on YouTube. Uh, we were unable to get a badge uh, for Stuart, uh, which reminds me, I have to emphasize, even though I'm wearing a pink badge, I'm speaking in my personal capacity and, and I have no representation of any country here. Um, uh, but um, Stuart led this study looking very specifically at the, uh, the economic impact of a global uh, carbon take back. And this, the reason this is important, I will come to as we, as we work through the talk. Um, just to re-emphasize what Margaret was saying, you know, we need, as I think everybody in this room knows, we need ge geological CO2 storage to meet Paris goals. Uh, this is from the average technology neutral scenarios, the 1.5 degree reports. Um, that's the total CO2 emissions to the atmosphere in blue, total CO2 produced from energy and industry in black. And it is striking when you, when you plot it this way, CO2 production only goes down two thirds by the time you get to net zero. We're storing in energy neutral scenarios, very large amounts of CO2 back underground. So, you know, in order to get to net zero, you know, we need less CO2 production, but we also need more CO2 storage. And the, the problem is in conventional uh, mitigation scenarios driven by a, a global carbon price or demand reduction measures modeled by a global carbon price, we see, and this is a, a simplified version of a figure from Stuart's paper, which again, I, I recommend you to follow up in Jewel and you can pick up a copy of the flyer as you leave and follow the little QR code there to actually read the original paper. We see getting to net zero requires carbon prices exceeding $1,000 a ton of CO2 by mid-century. And this is a bit strange because that's higher than the cost of direct air capture. So why do we see these carbon prices going that high in these models? And we have the explanation we believe in this paper because the models actually constrain the rate of deployment of air capture, which is largely modeled as BEX in these models. They constrain the rate of deployment. And so you can't, they, they assume we can't build it fast enough. And so the only way to drive down emissions by the time you get to mid-century is to impose punitive carbon prices to drive down demand. So that's what happens in these integrated assessment models. We believe that actually, if the right incentives were in place on fossil fuel industry producers in particular, we would be able to build carbon um, uh, air capture capacity much faster than is feared in these models. But the way of course to find that out, so the reason they get these very high costs is because our models assume that we don't build enough DA, uh, to direct air capture to compensate for our emissions. So the only way left to drive down emissions to zero is to impose punitive carbon prices. Um, we, we, in our paper, we imagined a, a, a global carbon take back obligation. Marguerite has already taken you through it. So it's a licensing condition. Um, we assumed that the sequestered CO2, the CO2 used to generate those all important carbon storage certificates that Marguerite talked about, could come from any CO2 that would otherwise have ended up in the atmosphere. Happy to take that assumption further in questions, but that's a really important one in costing this policy. Um, and then of course the sequestered fraction rises to 100% by 2050. So 10% um, by 2030, 50% by 2040, 100% by 2050, a smooth upward curve. So just to remind you how it works, this is where we are now. The extractor is giving, is, is basically passing on CO2 to industry, which flows through consumers to the atmosphere. And the, 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 the geological storage operator is not attached to anything. They're sad, they're sitting in a field because they have no customers and the government is doing nothing. That is a pretty good description of COP26, right? Uh, well, no, of, 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 the, of, of our current situation, perhaps I should say. Right, we introduce a carbon take back obligation. The government imposes an obligation on the extractor to buy carbon storage certificates. And they have to run out and find a geological storage operator and they pay them hard cash for, for geological storage certificates. So you, you immediately create a market of hungry fossil fuel companies who are making serious money right now. They've got a lot of cash. They're giving it back to their shareholders. They don't know what to do with their money right now. They could, should be paying it to geological storage operators to start getting rid of their CO2. As you ramp up the fraction, you get other businesses coming in, direct air capture operators, because we'll start to run out of industrial point sources of CO2. As we ramp up the sequestered fraction, the direct air capture industry takes off 
And we end up at 2050 with exactly the same carbon going out of the ground, coming out of the ground as going back in. And this, this figure is summarized in a little two pager, which Stuart produced, uh, which you can pick up as you leave, um, if you're one of the first 20 out of the room, or it has, they, or, or if they haven't all gone by the people who couldn't get into the room. So the really surprising thing about it, the, the main point of our paper was, was not to present the carbon take back obligation itself. You could argue it's so simple, we don't need to write a paper about it, but to address a, a, a concern that, in fact, Jan um, uh, raised with me. Uh, sorry to, 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 to call you out here, but whenever, whenever we, whenever Stuart and I had been proposed the carbon take back obligation um, over the past, as we had done frequently over the past decade, the concern was raised: what, what, what would it, what would its economic impact actually be? Can you actually tell us what it's going to do to the economy? So, okay, we took that on the chin. We said, okay, fine. We, we had to clearly try and model what would this policy do. To the world economy and what's interesting about it of course is that as the, as the sequestered fraction is small because you're only and, and, it, and because the cost of it is distributed over all fossil fuel users because as marguerite emphasized it's imposed right at the upstream at the point of extraction so all customers who use fossil fuels uh, would end up paying for it you know by the time we get to 10 percent sequestration by 2030, which, by the way, is probably about 10 times what we might get to with all of the projects in CCS that are being planned to at the moment, it's only costing the customer $7.50 per ton of CO2. It's, you know, like a tenth of the ETS price. So you could introduce this. And in fact, the problem with it, interestingly, this is a weird problem to have for a climate policy. It's too cheap. Because when you introduce it, it doesn't affect demand enough. And you end up, so this figure, it shows you what happens if all you have is a carbon take back obligation. You see that we, we drive up the fraction we sequester, and that goes to 100%. So we get to net zero. But because we don't reduce demand early enough, because the cost of the carbon take back obligation is too cheap, so nobody bothers to reduce their, their consumption of CO2, you end up storing an eye-watering amount of carbon by mid-century, and the overall cost of the policy is higher. And by the way, you also miss the 1.5 degree goal. So lots of bad things happen if you rely exclusively on a carbon take-back obligation as your only climate policy. And so this is me learning here as well. I guess 10 years ago, I'd have stood in front of you and say, forget about all these other climate policies. This is all you need. I, I'm, I am prepared to admit that I'm, I'm wrong. I hope the other side is as well. And I'm prepared to say, yes, okay, if all you relied on was a carbon take back obligation, you would end up with a suboptimal climate policy because you wouldn't drive down demand uh, fast enough to start with because the policy itself is too cheap. However, if we supplement a carbon take back obligation with a modest demand, uh, demand side measures, and these are one tenth of the cost at the time you get to. Uh, so we're not talking about thousand dollars a ton uh, uh, carbon taxes. We're talking about hundred dollar a ton uh, sort of th that sort of range uh, of carbon pricing to drive down demand. That's enough to get you into the same ballpark as the conventional policy and meet the one point five degree goal. So these are the main take homes from my talk. If you introduce a carbon take back obligation now, we reduce the risk of what I'm euphemistically causing non-economic constraints here, but you know, here's a non-economic constraint uh, on CCS deployment. Uh, you know, the, the public just objecting uh, to CCS deployment and slowing down its deployment um, to the point where we can't build it fast enough to meet the need for CD for carbon dioxide removal, and we end up meeting those thousand dollar a ton carbon prices to drive down demand to net zero mid-century. Um, this is uh, I. I, I would attest an, an essential backstop measure to all the demand side measures that you hear talked about extensively here. We need a backstop measure to make sure we will still get to net zero, even if we fail to drive down demand fast enough. And if it was implemented alongside demand side measures, we can meet Paris, uh, Paris Agreement goals at no significant additional cost compared to conventional policies. So um, that's, that's uh, my, my summary of carbon. Uh, the, the case for carbon take back, and I do encourage you to pick up um, uh, the, more, the more information sheets when you. But it's a great pleasure at this point. You know, the, the first question that I always get asked actually when I, 
people never ask me a question about the carbon takeback obligation. They, the, the first thing they ask is actually, ah, oh, but is CCS safe? And can you be sure of that? Um, so before I get that question, I'm going to hand over to Catherine Romanak, who's actually the right person to be asking it, to answer it, answering it. Thank you. Well, I, I just came under. Yeah. All right. I think I got it. Is it good? Got caught on the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. Thank you very much. And thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I'm so happy to be here today to talk to you about carbon capture and geological storage, because there really is a lot of misinformation going around about uh, CCS. And the more people that start to know about CCS, the more questions we get. So before I begin, I would like to just say that I am a research scientist at the University of Texas. I'm not here to advocate for any policies. Um, that's not my job. My job is to input the scientific um, basis for, um, for this technology. So that's what I'm here to do. So I think we've gone over this, but for those of you who don't know what CCS is, it is a very important uh, technology for mitigating large scale emissions from industrial point sources. Um, we capture the CO2 at the flue stack before it is emitted into the atmosphere, and then we transport it to a suitable geological site for long term permanent storage. And um, this can be done, as has been said, either primarily on the industry to stop the emissions getting into the atmosphere to begin with, but also CCS forms the basis for our carbon removal technologies, direct air capture and bioenergy with CCS. We need somewhere that's safe and secure to put those emissions. So how does it work? Well, um, CO2 is basically injected uh, with wells similar to what an oil and gas company uses to extract CO2. And it's, it's stored very deep in the geology, 800 meters deep at least. And what happens is when the CO2 is injected into a permeable formation, we make sure that overlying strata over the permeable formation are impermeable. So this is called structural trapping. And we make sure that the sites that we choose have that level of security above the reservoir. Um, there's other mechanisms that trap the CO2 as well, and one of them is residual trapping. So when the CO2 goes into the pore space, many times um, the CO2 will uh, snap off into small little droplets that then get, um, they get trapped in the, the pore space and they become immobilized. And then the third mechanism that creates the permanence of storage is dissolution and mineralization. There's brine or salty water in the reservoir. And over time, the CO2 will dissolve in this water and it will mineralize. And so these are all the different mechanisms that cause storage to be permanent over thousands of years, geological timescales. So we know this because in the United States, we've had 20 years of CCS, geological CO2 storage and research and development. And we started with very small injections with the car Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnership Program. We identified the areas in the country that would make good reservoirs for CO2 storage. And then little by little, we proved up the technology of storage and monitoring storage by moving to 1.6 million ton per year projects. And the program was so successful at gaining confidence in CO2 storage, that now the United States is looking to develop 50 million ton sites. So we, we feel very confident about the technology and we wanna be able to, um, to give our learnings uh, to the wider global community. So just remember that CO2 storage is safe by design. You might not know that the process that you have to go through in order to get a storage site is quite rigorous. Um, we need to get the site permitted and it requires a very high level of assurance in order to get that permit. We characterize the site to make sure that we have the right um, geology. 
And then we do extensive risk assessment with modeling to try to make sure that um, we have identified any of the potential unwanted outcomes. And then we design the project to further minimize any of those potential outcomes. And then we monitor it. And we monitor the site all the way from the reservoir, all the way to the top, um, including potable water sources and the biosphere and the environment. Um, the deep subsurface monitoring that we do is to verify that the CO2 in the reservoir is moving the way that we expected, nothing strange is happening. And then we monitor in the shallow subsurface for the assurance that there are no unwanted outcomes to the environment. And we also do this before, during, and after injection. So once the injection has stopped, we will continue monitoring during a post-injection period that then will um, allow us to say that the site is stable and that the liability can be handed over to whoever that long-term liability ent entity is. So CO2 in the subsurface is nothing new. We have, this is a map of global um, CO2 deposits, subsurface deposits. They're generally mostly um, originate from magmatic emissions, volcanic emissions, and also from the heating of rocks that are deep in the earth. Um, but you can see that it's, it's, it's everywhere. CO2 is everywhere. And handling of CO2 is nothing new. So if we're going to have a carbon take back, we're going to need to be, uh, we're going to need to have a transport of the CO2 as well as the storage. And we've been doing this in the United States um, since 1972. We've been using CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. So we've, um, and, and we've had to use because we weren't capturing CO2, we've had to use these natural deposits, mine them from the subsurface, transport them to the EOR facility. Um, and, and right now, after we've been capturing some storage, about 80% of the CO2 that is used for CO2 EOR comes from natural deposits. We have 6,000 kilometers of CO2 pipelines, just to give you an idea of what this looks like. Um, and it's estimated that we need about 80,000 new kilometers of CO2 pipelines um, to gain our objectives, our climate objectives for CO2. But that might sound big, like a large amount of pipelines. But just to give you an indication, right now we currently have, you know, orders of magnitude more pipelines where we are transporting hazardous liquids and CO2 is not explosive and it's not toxic. And yet we do every day, we transport more hazardous materials and pipelines. So just a quick example of a really interesting place. It's the Sac Rock oil field. It's in West Texas. It's been the longest running CO2 injection um, in the United States for enhanced oil recovery. And um, it, the, uh, the, pot, the, the CO2 is mined from natural deposits in Colorado. And it's, and it's pipeline to Texas. But what's so interesting about this is that if you think about it, the oil companies pay a lot of money and they go through a lot of effort to get this CO2. And they would like to just be able to recycle it with the oil. But what we find is that at least 50% of that CO2 stays in the ground, whether you like it or not. It wants to store itself. It, 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 it stores itself almost automatically. And so they have to continue to mine CO2 from these natural domes to, to keep bringing CO2 in the pipeline. So CO2 really likes to stay in subsurface. So how much space do we have? Well, we know that we have to upscale this technology by two orders of magnitude. And in 20 years, we've only stored about three gigatons of CO2 globally. We're currently storing 40 million tons per year, but we need to get up to two orders of magnitude more. We need 4,000 uh, mag mag million tons per year by 2035. And so do we have enough storage? Well, look at the amount that we need to store is 220 gigatons. And we have an estimated um, 8,000 to 55,000 gigatons of storage available. So the reason why there might be a large range in those is because we know that we have those, that space in the sedimentary basins, 
But then we'd have to make sure that the injectivity is there, that we can actually inject that CO2 and it will move into the formation. So we, we really do believe that there's more than enough storage capacity to implement um, as much storage as we need. The regulations are in place. The regulations are in place for demonstrating that the CO2 remains stored, that ensures environmental protection, and the accounting mechanisms, right? Because that's going to be really important for carbon take back units. You know, you're going to need to be able to know how much you're storing. So this began with the IPCC um, greenhouse gas guidelines in 2006, which set forth the um, procedures for accounting. And then in subsequent regulations, um, the modalities and procedures for monitoring, verification, and, and, and environmental protection. So you can see that we have a number of robust regulations based on the IPCC guidelines. And so, the, so accounting is important. And, um, and so we have protocols for accounting for the entire uh, life cycle of emissions for the CO2 that is captured, the CO2 that is transported, and the CO2 that is injected into the ge geological storage formation. And it's straightforward because unlike maybe nature-based solutions, it's a direct measurement by a meter at the wellhead that tells us exactly how much is going in. So we're continuously measuring how much CO2 is going in and the IPCC gives us guidelines for and methodologies and emissions factors for, cap, for the capture and the transport portion. Um, the storage site has to be monitored. There's not an emissions factor for a storage site. Each storage site is different. And so we need to monitor it. So um, if leakage does occur, then we monitor and we quantify the amount that has leaked. So the data are reported annually and they're verified by the regulator and they can be posted online. Uh, for transparency, and this is just one example of the EPA uh, accounting guidelines where you can literally, anybody can go and click on a link and you can get all the information on um, the, what's being stored, who's storing it, where's it, where it's being stored. And in the end, you get the total mass, total tons of CO2 sequestered. So everything is in place for this, um, this and other policies to be implemented. CCS is ready for deployment. It's not a unicorn technology as you might hear from some people. We are established we know that it works. Um, it's effective, it's safe by design. And it's really the only technology that can provide large scale permanent reductions in CO2 emissions. And um, we just need to get on with it. So thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much to our presenters. So uh, we're actually, before we hear reactions from a few uh, uh, environmental groups, we're actually gonna take a few questions from the audience. So we've heard about the policy carbon take back obligation, how it works, the underpinnings with carbon storage units. And I think what's been interesting to hear is that you know this is really another policy in the toolkit that can accelerate the transition away from fossil carbon. So this is, I think as Marguerite highlighted a couple of times, it's a policy that rides on top of existing demand side policy price signals. So this is actually making uh, the use of, of hydrocarbons more expensive, which only accelerates the transition towards net zero. Um, so that's one piece that, that came out for me. So anybody here in the room, we do have uh, comments coming in from YouTube as well. We had a little bit of issue with the link, but I'm hoping that our colleagues at Bologna have sorted that. Um, so for now, anybody here that would like to ask any questions before we get to reactions? Yes. Um, and we, uh, I've been given this, uh, this wired mic. So there we go. Thank you, Mark. So yeah, Matthias, thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, this does work. Yeah, so I distracted Eli earlier a little bit outside with this question. My, my concern is um, this does introduce a fairly new paradigm into the world that we know here. Uh, and, and so I see several risks that this could be used um, to further confuse people and then to do something that's not intended uh, through this mechanism. And uh, so to basically 
uh, fudge between emissions reductions and removals and or to um, basically generate a unit that is then used uh, even under article six as a non greenhouse gas metric uh, unit and then becoming sort of uh, not really comparable with uh, what we otherwise think of uh, should be happening with that mechanism. Great. So it's the, the question about the kind of purity of the policy, but when the devil's in the details, can, could there be some instance where uh, these two things get confused? Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, no, no, keep that mic away. Yeah. Um, so um, a few years ago, I'd have said, well, current policies aren't working anyway, so who cares? That's probably going a bit far now. Um, so uh, it, is a, it is an important point, And I think that the design of particularly early stage deployment of carbon take back would have to be done very carefully to make sure. And that's, that's why indeed we emphasize in our study that we need to complement it with demand reduction measures. But if you think of the purpose of this as a backstop policy to guarantee that we have the DAC capacity we're going to need to avoid those thousand dollar a ton carbon prices, then I think you can fit it in with other policies well enough. The motivation is, is there. And, and just to emphasize, people say, people worry about the risks of a new policy. Have you thought about the risks of a thousand dollars a ton carbon price? You know, if you weren't, then if you haven't, then you weren't in Paris in 2018 um, or whenever it was when the Gilets Jaunes were out. I mean, and that was an increase of $10 a ton in the carbon price. We're talking about an increase 100 times that over 30 years. All climate policies carry risks. We have to look at those risks carefully and we're all in favor of doing that. We want people to join us and look at how this could work as a backstop policy to guarantee we build the, 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 the plant we need. Great. Do we have one more question and then we'll take one question from the YouTube feed and then we'll have reactions. Yes. A simple or difficult question. How do you see it being implemented? Uh, yeah, I think there's different ways of doing it, but um, the big question is at what level do you implement it? So as we all know, the ideal policy is implemented at global level. Everybody does it at the same time. The ideal climate price and those kind of, you know, utopias, but that's not the way you're going to get things done on time. So in the Netherlands, we're looking at, can we implement it at the country level before it's scaled up to a regional level, to a global level? Because then we think, you know, just like with technologies, you can demonstrate how it works in practice and convince others to join. So that's why we're looking as a first step to implement it, implement it under producer responsibility regulations. Um, that it really was a very practical choice to say, which kind of policies can we implement at the national level? Uh, are we allowed to implement at a, a national level uh, from an EU perspective also? And producer responsibility regulations are implemented at the national level. And when the percentages are still low, that is possible. So that's the plan at the moment. Look at how we could implement it in the Netherlands at, uh, under those regulations, but work very hard in getting uh, the North Sea region aligned to scale up to a climate take back region at North Sea level so that we then can move on to European level and hopefully a few country, other countries in the world indeed that also want to join the carbon take back region uh, basically uh, so that you can exchange carbon storage units also and get a bigger market for these units. Thanks, Marguerite. So one class question coming in from Hugh Richards. Uh, he, he mentions the Jewel paper, which just came out, uh, which Stuart Jenkins led and Miles and myself were also on um, that mentions uh, any, any uh, so we talk about these carbon storage units, right? What forms of carbon storage are appropriate to create a carbon storage unit? In the paper, it talks about GCS, geological carbon storage, and it mentions any process that stores CO2 with, an, uh, with a very negligible risk of reversal. So the question is uh, from, the, from the member on YouTube, how mature are other options uh, for uh, uh, negligible risk of reversal carbon storage? other than injection into deep geological formations? Because so, so can you speak to a little bit about the other uh, technologies that would uh, be appropriate for a carbon storage unit? Uh, 
Sure. So we typically mention our uh, uh, carbon black. So if you do pyrolysis, uh, split methane into carbon and uh, hydrogen, you get carbon black. Uh, if you put that in a safe place, it's a solid. So that should be, uh, you know, it's kept out of the short cycle carbon loop. That's our criteria. Mineralization, olivine, uh, that's in a fairly uh, advanced stage of development, but it's not large scale, uh, done at a large scale. And then you have ones in a grayer area, like uh, putting CO2, for example, in concrete, you know, how long is that actually? And you get into discussions of certifying uh, the duration of it, but yeah, there, there are more options than just CO2, putting CO2 in the ground. Great, excellent. Awesome. So now we're actually going to turn to reactions from uh, two environmental groups. We're really lucky to have with us today, uh, Lee Beck, if you could join us. Uh, Lee Beck is with the Clean Air Task Force. She's been the International Director for Carbon Capture and Storage, but I believe now she's actually leading all of their advocacy efforts in Europe uh, and a number of other elements. So Lee is fantastic. We're very fortunate to have her with us. Um, we also have Marilyn Demers from Natura Le Milieu, a, a Dutch group uh, that's been working on conservation and environmental advocacy since 1972. Uh, and we're very pleased to have you with us as well, joining remotely. So we were hoping just to hear maybe three minutes each, if you could just react from the perspective of civil society, from the stakeholders that you represent in your groups uh, and, and your stance as an environmental uh, uh, NGO, uh, what, what are your reactions to the viability of the policy, the carbon take back obligation? Uh, let's, let's begin the conversation and see where it takes us. So first to Marlene and then we'll hear from Lee. Thank you uh, uh, for having me in your uh, meeting. Um, and um, first of all, I think it's a very interesting approach. Um, I'm, I must say also considering the perspective of having a backstop measure, um, but I would like to share a different uh, perspective that we have on the whole concept, agreeing that we need to empty the bathtub. Eh? That is the, the, I think the, the premises we all, uh, we all know about and share. But our concern is that we focus on uh, emptying the, the, the bathtub on one side, but do not reduce uh, at, a, at the other side, adding uh, CO2 emissions from fossil sources. And um, um, uh, by having just the, the, the emptying side, including uh, risks as well. So we, we add additionally uh, create additional uh, risks. In our view, um, the, the first priority is to reduce the use of fossil fuels in a faster, uh, faster pace than we currently do and than we currently project. So that is for us the key priority. There are positive effects uh, of this approach that we do uh, recognize. Eh? And one is that it creates embedded costs, uh, a price effect uh, on fossil fuels, which will reduce um, then demand plus that it has the advantage that it um, makes the polluter pay. And that principle is what we very much uh, uh, support. Then looking at the, um, the projects to reduce uh, carbon uh, um, from, uh, from, the, from the source is that depending on which project you select, there's uh, also a risk because not all projects will be uh, easily administered and there could be fraud and abuse of compensation projects uh, as well. And then looking at the total objective that we have uh, from the Paris Agreement, you could also say that all these CO2 reduction projects, um, the carbon removal, they should be done anyway. And so now linking them together and financing these projects through um, the carbon take back responsibility is of course an extra, um, potential uh, stimulus, it, 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 it creates finance and, and, and a push for these projects, but the, these projects are necessary anyway. And if you do them anyway, and then now in this, in this concept, use them to compensate for fossil emissions, then you actually destroying their negative impact because you compensate them directly with, uh, with emissions. So that's just, you know, switching the whole concept around. Then, of course, there, that we see a gain. Uh, what I said, fossil fuels uh, pay for their own waste, which is a gain. Um, there's a force for creating negative impact projects um, and a, a way to finance them. Um, and also the concept that the, the fossil emissions are limited to 
the available compensation uh, might also be interesting, although that, that will also create a risk of oversizing these compensation uh, projects on the longer run and creating a, a lock-in uh, for longer term uh, emissions. Um, so we think it could be interesting to look at if it is part of a package. And in that package, um, it needs to be secured that the selection of compensation projects is fair and sustainable and fairly priced, but also that we have a very clear phase out pathway for fossil fuels, which is binding. So that it will not be an excuse, this, this mechanism will not be an excuse to extend the life cycle of the, the products um, uh, in, in fossil fuels. Um, the advantage is also, uh, in the package, we also need to make sure that there's enough investment in energy savings and, and more than enough investment in renewable energy. And we have a concern that this uh, approach of uh, carbon take back responsibility creates um, distraction from those um, objectives. So we only see it as an opportunity in this total package. And then in terms of the risks of uh, CCS, um, I understand that there's a, a, a lot of research being done to investigate if CCS is actually a safe uh, option and if it's safe by design. But um, we do uh, uh, realize that there's a quite a bit of an energy requirement for CCS, which is creating additional em uh, emissions. And it requires eternal uh, long-term uh, monitoring as well. So it's not a, an option that relieves the future generations from the burden of our um, 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 uh, um, um, uh, yeah, our uh, our economy really, and and the impact, the negative impact of our economy. So, in that sense, that is not a, an attractive uh, perspective. So it's it's it sounds good, eh, putting carbon dioxide back in the back into the ground, but even if all the risks can be uh, managed safely, then still there's a long term, um, uh, um, yeah. Um, problem with it or, or a negative side to, to it. So summarizing it, it's an interesting approach, especially because of the responsibility it creates for the fossil fuel sector to take responsibility for their emissions. Um, but we see it as an option if we are able to put it in this strong package where we achieve all the goals and not just uh, uh, lengthening the life cycle of fossil fuels. Thank you, Marla. That was really excellent. So we, we heard some really powerful messages around ensuring that the CTBO does in no way uh, uh, fails to accelerate the reduction in, in the uh, use of fossil fuels, the risks of geological carbon storage, the energy requirement, making sure that the technology itself, uh, all those risks are mitigated. And then I think uh, there is a really important point you made almost about additionality. The idea that uh, many of these projects uh, actually need to happen anyway. And so uh, we need to make sure that the motivation for them happening and the, the financial additionality of whether or not a project goes forward uh, is, is taken into account. And then the piece about putting this policy in a larger package. Thank you. Those who are on YouTube, we're just getting some announcements from uh, someone up above. Uh, in the in the venue. Um, okay, so I maybe we could have some quick reactions from the panel, and then we'll go to Lee. No. No. Well, well, well uh, very quick reaction from me. I mean, strongly agreeing with you, Mar uh, Murray Lane, and and that's I think the key result of this paper was that uh, a CTBO, a carbon takeback obligation, works best as part of the package, and that's exactly the sort of result we actually find in the modeling we do in the paper, which Stuart Jenkins did in the paper, um, which shows that if you rely on a carbon take back obligation alone, you end up with far too much fossil carbon dioxide being produced and then a, a, a major headache um, disposing of it um, in, in, in the future. So, so I, we, we completely agree with you there. But the, the really interesting thing is we need, that we see very naturally a transition from relying on other measures now to drive down demand and the carbon take back obligation being kind of a little niche 
activity in the corner that nobody can nobody really notices and then over 30 years it becomes the whole show and because that's what you need to actually get us all the way to net zero we're not gonna we're not gonna price fossil fuels out of the economy where it's just unrealistic to think that's going to happen so um so that's that natural transition we see and you need both ends of that you know you need to have built that backstop for it to be there when you need it yeah, just to add to that, I think uh, what we've also discussed in the stakeholder group last year was that you can actually also ratchet it up to above 100 percent. Eh? So the carbon removal, if you say it's not going fast enough or fossil fuels are not being declining quickly enough, you can say we ratchet it up above that. And we, in 2050, if we still use far too much fossil fuels, you go above uh, 100%, 150% and make it more expensive still to uh, and therefore encourage the removal cost uh, to be part of the uh, fossil energy product basically. So you can play with that percentage uh, and speed it up if you want to. When I, when I want to really wind people up, I suggest maybe we need a healthy fossil fuel industry to pay for CDR for carbon dioxide removal. But I think that's probably going a little bit far, but but you know, we know somebody's going to have to pay for it. Yeah. So just just to the comment about leaving uh, about geological CO two storage leaving the next generation with a problem, I would just highly disagree with that. I I would say leaving the carbon in the atmosphere is what is creating the problem for future generations. Um, things in the subsurface they don't bother us. Uh, the monitoring requirements. Um, some of the highest monitoring requirements are like mostly around 50 years after the storage site is closed. But when you can show via the monitoring that the plume has stabilized and everything is fine, many times the regulator feels so good about that that they'll just say, we can stop the monitoring now because it's evident and obvious that the plume is stabilized there. But the monitoring that we do is environmental monitoring. So the data that we would collect on the environment could be used for other purposes. I mean, it's, it's we're, we're monitoring the biosphere and the soils and the atmosphere at these sites. So there's additional um, you know, benefits that could be had from monitoring. I don't see it as a problem for future generations. We'll come back to you, Marlene. Uh, first, we're gonna hear from uh, Lee back from the Clean Air Task Force. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, Miles, Marguerite, Catherine, and Eli, for this really insightful discussion today and really bringing this debate to COP. Um, I really have three part comments. First part, uh, who's Clean Our Task Force? We're an environmental organization. We focus on a variety of clean energy solutions, innovative technologies, hydrogen, carbon capture, methane abatement. Please come join us at TV90 at the Methane Moment Pavilion. So it's geothermal. And from our perspective, we need to commercialize all technologies in a safe way to enable each country or region to decarbonize with a technology portfolio that suits local, regional, and economic circumstances. So that's kind of how we're looking at decarbonization to prevent technology path dependency. And so, of course, um, we have a big team working on carbon capture and storage, and we, we think it's relatively, probably virtually impossible to decarbonize without these technologies. The second part that I want to emphasize in the context of this discussion is policy innovation. We're obviously uh, not delivering emissions reductions fast enough, and obviously our policy um, portfolio or our policy options aren't completed. So discussions like this today are really, really important to show what are the next generation of policies that are necessary. The CTBO context has come up in the, for example, in the United States in multiple proposed legislation, government take back obligations for the commercializations of direct air capture. There are supply side carbon taxes with CCS funds attached and uh, labor funds attached. So there's this, this, this topic is really, really important. And the third part is now where I come to the CTBO. It's really, I think it ties nicely into this really, really hard question that nobody wants to talk about and what is the future of fossil? 80% of primary energy demand is until this day satisfied by fossil fuels. We, fuels are the main, yeah, it's the way we consume energy. And right now we haven't seen a solution. So we need to encourage this debate. And the Clean Air Task Force really looks at the CTBO as one policy option because as 
Magritte said it's a conditional ban on fossil fuels, and it outlines a path how we could get off of fossil fuels. And it also breaks through the dichotomy of decarbonization versus fossil fuel phase out. The IPCC has shown the faster we can reduce emissions, the better our chance at fending off the worst effects of climate change. So we can't, shouldn't delay emissions reduction because we haven't figured out how to, how to phase out fossil fuels fast enough. In addition to that, 70% of fossil fuel reserves are not held by private companies that could be incentivized by divestment pressure, but really by national oil companies. And again, so I just came, I was late to this event because I came from the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia pavilion where we had another discussion about the circular carbon economy. And there, the CTBO concept is also in discussion in a slightly different perspective. So I think this is a really, really important concept. Um, Claire Tasser is looking forward to working with Miles, Marguerite, Ela, and Catherine on this and really um, trying to understand how how is it implementable? I think we talked about this Obviously, there are already policy proposals, but we really need to hammer out who the first mover or first movers in terms of countries are, and then how it can be paired with demand side policies, carbon pricing, carbon taxes, as well as commercialization incentives for carbon capture and storage technologies. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lee. And let's have a very quick reaction from the panel, and then we'll turn to questions, uh, which I hope we can address to all five that we've got gathered here remotely and in, pres in presence. So any quick reactions? Or should we go straight to questions? OK, great. Um, questions? Anybody have any questions? I'll check the YouTube as well. We've got a few people coming in. Oh, Lee, Lee has a question. <laughs> Perfect. I mentioned a couple of examples of how this concept has popped up. Is there a, a certain con or a concept or discussion that you're following that you think is particularly interesting? Think about the carbon storage unit conversation in Saudi Arabia or perhaps in the US context. Would just love to, to hear how you, all of you are thinking about this or Eli or Amadran. Well, um, one one model. Uh, somebody asked Margriet earlier on, how would you get started on this? And you, you mentioned that you know the, the Netherlands could sort of be a, 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 a national leader on this, or a North Sea Alliance of countries um, could lead nationally. Uh, another interesting option would be a buyers alliance of a, a group of companies that need fossil fuels and need to decarbonize and don't know how to do it any other way. Uh, like, for example, the world's airlines, they could de demand that their suppliers comply with a carbon take back obligation so as to save the world's airlines having to waste lots of resources, scratching their heads to try and work out how to how to decarbonize themselves. And they, they're doing lots of stuff that to many people doesn't make a lot of sense, like, you know, working out how to use biofuels and planes when the biofuels actually have a higher carbon footprint than that. Anyway, you know, we, you, you know where I'm going here. Um, maybe they should just hand the problem back to their fuel suppliers. Um, and, and this would be a way of them doing that as a, as a buying, a, a, a buyer's, uh, a, it's not a, it's not a um, uh, what's, what's the name of a buyer's uh, block? Um, it's, it's not a, it, well, sort of, you know, as, as a procuring block or procuring club perhaps um, for, for, for green, green, green uh, fossil fuels. Um, that that that'd be one one interesting model. That, I don't know. Like maybe we could raise with 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 airlines as an example. Yeah. Yes, gentlemen here. Uh, I would like to know what you mean by green fossil fuels, please. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, as soon as I used the phrase, I realized no, I probably shouldn't have used that one. Um, but so it's absolutely fair. Um, but um, we have to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming, above all. And we have to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming before the world stops using fossil fuels. That's also clear, including from decisions made at this COP. So if we're going to meet Paris goals, we need to, that, that doesn't make them green. I mean, they, they will still be a non renewable resource. But at least they can be a non-renewable resource that doesn't cause global warming. That's the outcome we're aiming for here. So, you know, that, that would be, uh, so I shouldn't have used the word green there, but uh, we need another word 
that simply means a product that doesn't cause global warming. Great. Yes, just over here. And then we have a question coming in from YouTube. But yeah, Mark, if you can pass the mic there, thanks. Um, what do you consider to be the biggest barrier to introducing it as a policy in the UK, but and globally as well? Yeah, I think there's several barriers, but I think the fact that it's, uh, it, it really is a new concept. So it, people are very focused on emissions and all kinds of emission policies. And this is a very different concept and people are basically unsure. Uh, what I, like Marjolein is saying, uh, and we had those discussions last year with the big stakeholder group, people are intrigued, but they think, yeah, but what if we do it? Could there be unintended consequences? And everybody has their own unintended consequences in their head that they would like to avoid, uh, which is why we spend so much time on trying to agree objectives and boundary conditions to make sure that we keep those at the front of our mind when we take the next steps with this policy so that we don't go astray and check that there are indeed no unintended consequences. So the, the unfamiliarity with it uh, and, and the fear of unintended consequences, I think is probably for all players, the, the main barrier. Great. Uh, we have one question for YouTube and then I'll go right back to you. Yeah. Um, so, so someone, uh, Hugh on YouTube is asking, uh, you know, what types of carbon are included under this, this idea? And I think what's interesting about the carbon storage unit idea is it's very different from conventional carbon accounting. It just tracks when you take carbon out of the subsurface, out of the hard earth and introduce it into our world. And that of course also includes not just the fossil fuels, but also uh, limestone and, and other materials. And so the gentleman is asking, uh, what are the challenges for the non-hydrocarbons, I suppose, in the context of including them in something like a carbon take-back obligation? Because after all, it's, it's the total amount of carbon that we extract that is what the atmosphere cares about. Well, just as a point of fact, in, in Stuart Jenkins' paper, we counted limestone as a fossil fuel, so to speak. I mean, we just included it as fossil CO2 source. Um, so um, in principle, you could include it um, in exactly the same way that you would treat, you'd have to measure what limestone people were using, what they were doing with it, and how much CO2 it was generating. And that would then incur a carbon take back obligation on the cement producer, who would probably be able to discharge it themselves by capturing their own CO2. So, I mean, it, there's, a, there's a sort of neat um, uh, partial circularity there. Yeah. Um, but, 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 you know, I, these, are the, these are the nitty gritty questions that need to be teased down. Yeah. I think the main challenge is that the cement industry is, is running on a very tight margin. And it's, if they were also subject to this, there would have to be other provisions made to, to enable low carbon cement. Um, we have a- I would have to be very careful not to use the phrase green cement. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Okay, back to you, yes. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't here when the concept was explained. So I'm sorry if this question has already been answered. But when you're talking about carbon take back, is this the future emissions or is it or does it also relate to the past emissions? It's a very important question because as we know, the suppliers know since the early 1970s that there was a link between the use of fossil fuels and the emissions, and they have spent a lot of money investing to deny in denial in the same way that the tobacco producers spent a lot of money denying the link between tobacco and cancer. So I think it would be just, if we are talking about the just transition, that if there is carbon takeover, it should also relate to the, all the past emissions. And the uh, interesting thing about if this is accepted, is that that would at, le at last give us um, people who uh, can, be, can, be, can be made responsible for the losses and damages suffered by the southern countries already. That's one point. And the second point is that as, you, as we have seen uh, countries like India are saying that, I'm not Indian, no? Just country like India are saying that uh, they cannot uh, go to net zero before 2070. Uh, because they need to develop, because there's a lot of poverty, et cetera, et cetera. I don't agree with this. But uh, um, if this money could be used 
to develop uh, solar energy, wind energy, the renewables in the southern countries. There are a lot of projects in the southern countries. And if I am here, it is because I'm looking for investors uh, and which are difficult to um, find uh, the money because there is a perception of country risk. That is to say a lot of these countries, and that is true, are not stable politically, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. And Marjolein, feel free to raise your hand on Zoom if you want to jump in as well. Yeah, it's to, to you, Marguerite. Yeah. Well, uh, um, yeah, to your first point, uh, historical uh, emissions, I think that links to what I was discussing before, that you can go over 100%. So by tweaking the percentage of take back, uh, how much carbon you put in the ground for every ton of carbon you take out of the ground, if you take that over 100%, you're basically starting to remove historical emissions on the back of the fossil carbon supply chain. Uh, so that would be, if society would want to do that, that would be the way indeed to uh, make fossil energy producers responsible also for part of the historical uh, emissions that have been caused. So th th it, it is a handy tool in that sense. On the um, sort of international aspects of it, and you mentioned um, investments in uh, uh, developing countries and so forth. Um, the a, a crucial point here is that you would apply the carbon take back obligation at the company level. Uh, I, we, we, so it would be, a, you know, you would be asking, does a company comply with the carbon take back obligation rather than intrusive questions about countries? And so there might well be many companies, India was the example you used, there might be many companies based in India who might want to get to net zero before 2070. In fact, many Indian companies have actually announced, made announcements of an intention to be net zero compliant, you know, net zero ambitions before 2070. So a, a carbon take back obligation would allow companies to use, who are still using fossil fuels, no matter where they're based in the world, to be confident that their continued fossil fuel use is consistent with net zero by a given date. So in, in some ways that might make some of these conversations easier because it would allow the ambitious um, private sector movers uh, wherever they are based in the world to um, move, move perhaps faster than their national governments are requiring them to do. Okay. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Um, so one question I kind of wanted to bring in was uh, this distinction between reductions and removals, right? So at Carbon Gap, we're focused on carbon removals specifically. Um, I think the way the carbon take back obligation works is it's agnostic to the source of CO2. So can you talk about the kind of transition that would happen naturally or the ways in which you could enforce that transition if you're creating a demand for carbon storage units? If you have a policy that's essentially requiring anyone who wants to take carbon out of the ground to put carbon back in, what kinds of carbon are they going to put back in? And how do we make sure that they're putting the right kinds back in? There's no sort of uh, strange incentives that cause unusual behavior that we wouldn't want. Uh, any, any reflections on that and the kind of quality of the carbon that we're putting back into the ground? Yeah. We, we're so, sometimes uh, we got a picture also with three waves, basically. We think the first wave will be the large point sources, uh, especially in areas, of course, where there is carbon pricing already. So you get that synergy there. Um, but at some point, the easy, uh, they will get more and more expensive, the existing point sources. So I think at that point, uh, companies who are supplying uh, gas or fossil energy, they would be looking at decarbonizing things themselves. So they would say, can we switch to uh, supplying hydrogen or can we switch to supplying electricity and uh, capture the CO2 and store it so that we make sure we have enough storage units to be able to do that. That's the second wave. So basically decarbonizing fossil energy supply, going as much as possible, as I said, to the energy carriers of the future, so that you don't get a lock in on the uh, infrastructure or the consumer side. They can switch then to their future energy carrier, but it may, if we don't scale up the ones fast enough, you may supply it for a while with fossil decarbonized fossil energy. And the third one, 
is the removals. So if you uh, then still want to use, like for example, airlines, fossil, uh, fossil energy, you won't have to uh, start looking at removals to be able to get CO2 to put in the ground to balance your production and your storage. Great. Lee. I just wanted to add two things, of course. So first of all, um, removals and um, point stores, of course, has to be separated as Marguerite suggested. The other um, aspect that I did want to mention is the decarbonization of fossil fuels through, for, for example, through hydrogen production, definitely necessary, but has to go hand in hand with methane regulation. Again, methane regulation is the most important thing we can do to um, reduce the risk of or reduce um, warming. Um, and then the final thing, of course, is also, I think a policy framework like this would give clarity for fossil fuel um, company and business model transformation. It, it gives companies a clear idea and certainty on how to scope where they have to be by 2050 and a clear pathway to transform through um, commercializing existing, or commercializing carbon capture technology. So I just wanted to highlight this advantage and some of these caveats in the implementation. Sorry, Marilyn had a. Marilyn, had Marilyn a, please come uh, in. Yeah, thank you. I would just like to add that, um, of course, we we would look at uh, different ways of um, uh, carbon removal. But if you look at um, the volumes that are required eh, to uh, to compensate for the current fossil fuel um, um, emissions, that is so huge um, that only CCS would probably be able to to um, be sufficient to, to provide sufficient volume for uh, compensation. And, and here we also need to look at, you know, how can we create sort of a balance between the um, phase out pathway for fossil fuels uh, in such a way that it's also feasible to, uh, to compensate with, um, um, with CCS uh, while also pushing as much as possible for the transition to re to greener technologies. Thank you. Do you want to come in quickly, Miles, and then we're going to have I'm, one more I'm, question, and then we'll bring it to let's close. Let's bring in another question. Okay, great. Uh, Christian, just here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Christian Heves Dernot from uh, Salfo and uh, Bellona. Um, quick question. So it seems uh, there is a major communications uh, challenge uh, behind all of this, uh, correct? As you mentioned, uh, the concept is very difficult to explain in, in layman uh, uh, language. Uh, and, and so could you give us maybe, you know, just from the top of your head, uh, what, what are the three principles that you would like uh, proponents of the, of the idea of the concept to convey to, to layman audiences without immediately having to explain the full dynamics of the system. I don't know. You're, you're absolutely right. We've been struggling with this for years. I mean, I summarize, we need to stop fossil fuels from causing global warming before the world stops using fossil fuels. And we need those who benefit most from our continued use of fossil fuels which is not you, the consumer, it's the person who owns those fuels when they come out of the ground, that's where most of the money is made. We need those people to pay for the cleanup. If you put it that way, very few people object. And in fact, the generally the reaction is, well, that's kind of obvious. What I find really interesting is the, well, that's kind of obvious reaction tends to come from people outside of COP26, outside of the climate bubble. Those of us inside the climate bubble, we immediately ask, how does that fit with an ETS? How does that work under Article 6? How does that, you know, all this stuff. If you're outside the climate bubble, uh, implying producer responsibility, imposing producer responsibility on fossil fuel producers, telling them they need to clean up the CO2 that is generated by an inevitable consequence of their products, just as a water company has to dispose of your sewage and they can't just say, well, the water was perfectly clean when we sold it to you. No, that's not good enough. If they have to dispose of your sewage properly, they can't just chuck it in the river. Fossil fuel companies shouldn't be allowed just to chuck CO2 into the atmosphere. That's it. Final comments from Marguerite, and then we're going to bring to a close. Uh, yeah, I would like to add th that water analogy sometimes really makes people understand that it really makes no sense, considering how big the climate change problem is, that we say 
if you put CO2 in the air, let's put a tax on it so you can pay to pollute basically because you would still put it in the air. If you would put your dirty water in the rivers, you say, no, you got to clean it up before you put it in the rivers because it starts smelling, the fish start dying. But for some reason, because you cannot smell CO2, we think, well, let's just put a tax on it and hope people change their behavior. It makes no sense. Climate change is a big problem. So we say, no, instead of paying to pollute, people have to pay to clean up. So they have to actually do something with that CO2. They're still paying. The product price goes up just as with the CO2 tax, but you're paying to clean up instead of paying to pollute. And I think that makes sense considering the harm the CO2 is doing in the atmosphere. We should stop it, not just start uh, charging for it. Marjolein, the final, final word? Well, I said. think it, it's also very much in the order of things that, that makes it acceptable, more acceptable or not. Eh? If you position it as a way, as a solution for the fossil sector to continue their business, um, then you basically say, okay, we reduce the CO2, but we continue with the old economy and with the fossil fuels and all the risks that go with that for additional emissions anyway. But if you start with, we're, we're, we're phasing out fossil fuels, and as long as we still have them, we ask the, the sector uh, to take care of their waste properly and safely, etc. then it's a different story. But I think it's important to, to, to start with phasing out fossil fuels. Yes, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to Bologna, to Oxford Net Zero, to everyone that made this event possible, and to Mark Reed for bringing it all together. And let's have a big round of applause for all of our panelists, remote and present. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.